In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, glory to Jesus Christ. Glory, glory, glory. Oh, beloved, the Christian man walks in a very strange world. He walks in a world that seems so broken and so wretched. And yet, in this world that is so broken, underneath there is a glory that breaks forth every once in a while. And so it's like the world is covered with this kind of crust, this outer crust of rot and wretchedness, but underneath, every once in a while, this crust will grow thin and gold will shine through it. And we'll see this gold, we'll see this silver, we'll see this blessedness. When God came to earth and he recreated it in the Jordan River by being baptized in it and he began his ministry, he began to recreate this world the way he wanted it always to be. He has restored paradise to us in a sense. Men, of course, balk at this. They say, what does that mean? I still see all the wretchedness. I see death. I see crime. I see sins. I don't see perfection. I see men dying with open sores covering them. What do you mean by that? What I would say is that Christ has all the power in the world to restore creation to absolute immaculateness. But forgive me, what good would that do man? Adam had all the goodness possible that one could imagine, but he had no goodness in his heart. At least he chose not to have any. And so Christ puts eyes in a man's face that has no eyes. He raises the dead. He reverses wrath. He reverses corruption. He does every single good thing you could imagine. But what he really comes to do first is to build a new foundation, and that is a clean heart. And so he brings the man the water of paradise. He begins the work of recreating the world. But he lets men continue to be free, while at the same time underneath is the glory of God waiting to break forth. It's waiting to come forth. It's waiting to be present. And so the Lord waits for men to cultivate paradise in their hearts. He waits for this. And we see paradise all around us all the time. When you go and you see the saints, the saints work great wonders. In fact, all the saints do. And so when you see the great saints in Russia, for example, who live in the woods, the animals walk past the cells in which these men live. And these men cultivated paradise in their hearts. They did what Christ asked. They suffered from all kinds of afflictions and troubles. But they looked into their hearts and began to cultivate paradise in here. They began to pray deeply in here. They received the body and blood of Christ. They received the paradise that Christ has brought to earth. And they put it into their hearts. And their hearts became inflamed. And the more they began to pray, the more paradise began to open all around them. And pretty soon the animals who walk past their cell smell this. They smell paradise. They say, oh my goodness, Adam has returned to us again. Adam has come back to us. And they go to the saints and they see them. There's a great story of St. Seraphim of Sarah, one of the greatest saints we know, one of the greatest fathers and lovers of God that we know. One time, he was, he was a spiritual father to nuns in a nearby monastery, but he lived in the forest by himself. And so sometimes the nuns would have big problems, big spiritual questions, so they had to go to him and ask him these questions to get their perplexities resolved. And so one time, this nun went to see him. And as she was walking through the woods, she suddenly saw him sitting on a log outside of his house, his humble little self, and he was feeding this massive bear. This massive bear was licking his hand, the seen of it. And the woman screamed. Because she was, she was weak. She was a woman of the flesh. She was a nun, but she was of the flesh. She wasn't of the spirit. She screamed because she didn't know what to do. And St. Seraphim turned and said, oh my goodness. And he smacked the bear in the nose. And turned it and ran away into the forest. He said, go. Oh, get away. The bear turned and ran away. And the nun was screaming and screaming. And he said, oh my goodness, mother, come down. Oh my goodness, come down, mother, come down. Come here. Come here. He brought her into, her, he brought her into his cell. He said, mother. He said, why are you so sad? Mother, calm down. Calm down, please. Calm down, sister. Calm down. He began to talk, and he was holding her hand very gently, saying, oh, my joy, I'm sorry, be, be calm, please, be calm, be calm. And finally, she calms down after a while, after a while. <laughs> All of a sudden, there's, some, there's this big noise, and the bear pushes open the door with his nose and comes in. And in one of his paws, he has this massive piece of honeycomb that he's ripped from this pie. And he offers it to Sarah, and he's saying, Sarah, oh, my goodness, my child, don't you see? You're so sweet. He offended you so badly, and here he is trying to make amends. You should, you should forgive him, please. Forgive him. He, he erred. But forgive me. When paradise is present, paradise is everywhere. Paradise is all around them. But because of men's sins, it's not available to them. And so, like, we have all kinds of saints. Well, there was, you know, during the 1980s in, in the Soviet Union, a lot of monks could not, there was a lot of men who were monks, but they couldn't be in monasteries because there weren't any. And if they went to monasteries, they'd be arrested. And so many of them went to the Caucasus, the high mountains, and they lived there for a long time. And there would be monks who go up to these mountains who bring them food. They, go and stay, they want to go and see these men. They say, I want to see the fathers in the Caucasus, what they're doing. And the fathers in the Caucasus were wild. They were, they were praying to Jesus for all the time. They met one guy who was saying, the soldier 24-7, who just read it all the time. And they went to this one man and they said, what do you do when you run out of water? Because the Caucasus are high and rugged and sometimes you can't find water. 
And so the monks, said, they smiled. They said, oh, we have an elder. He said, they said, whenever we run out of water, whenever we need water, we call this elder and he comes. And the elder will come and he'll make the sign of the cross over a rock and he'll take his prayer up and smack it and water will flow out of it, just like Moses. It continues to this day, my son. It, you know, this is how God provides for us. And this is in the 1970s that this miracle happened. And so paradise literally, it's almost like the world is sheathed in garbage, but underneath it is what Christ has done, Christ's accomplishment. It's underneath everything, waiting to break forth, waiting for you to take you know, a polishing rag and polish a little bit, and all of a sudden you'll see the shine. It's actually there. Is the weakness still there? Yes. Is death still there? Of course, because sin is still there. Men still choose to sin, so therefore the corrosion, the brokenness, the wretchedness is still present. But that facade of that crust of nonsense is still there because men still choose it. They still like it, and so they still keep it, and so the crust remains. But if you go to the holy places, you see that this crust is, is worn thin. It wears so thin that sometimes heaven punches through it. In fact, if you went through the Celts, and you spoke to the Celts, the Celts would talk about holy places being narrow places, places where this wall between heaven and earth was rubbed thin, like so thin that you could almost put your hand through it. And they say, if you go to the holy man's cell, you'll see that heaven is there. Paradise is there. Paradise is already present. This is what Christ has accomplished by being born from the Virgin Mary and also dipping himself in the Jordan. The Jordan is the water of creation all over again. And so Christ in this moment recreates the whole world. But he leaves it. Patiently he waits for the right time to spring forth everything that he has done. And so what should men do with this? What should men do with the things that I'm saying? Well, of course you should live by faith. You should have joy. But the work that Christ has given to man is to be gardeners once more. Adam was put into the garden to be a gardener, and so are you. The work of mankind is to go back into the garden and to cultivate paradise wherever you are. You live in a cell, good, cultivate it into paradise. You go to work, make it into paradise. First, establish the paradise here, inside your heart. And go and establish it where you live. Wear down the walls of the, the crust of nonsense which surrounds us. Rub against it and, and, and wear it away by the prayer of the heart. Establish paradise everywhere. If you have a home, make it into paradise. Your home should be heaven. That's what it should be. Christ has come to earth, and wherever Christ is, that's where heaven is. When God came down, heaven came with him. They cannot leave him. Heaven cannot be apart from him. Wherever he goes, there is heaven. And so when he went to the Jordan, the water of his people, the water that marks the promised land, the water of the promised land, so to say, the border of the promised land, he enters into it and brings heaven with him. Wherever he goes, glory follows. Even if he humbles himself, no matter what he does, glory follows. That's why all these miracles surround Christ. That's where the animals bow down and worship him, because wherever he goes, his glory cannot be hidden. It cannot be hidden, except from the eyes of the sinful. And so, beloved, delight in the waters of Jordan, delight in his glory, cultivate it in your own house, and most importantly, in your own heart. And from your heart, spread it from one person to the next. And live in this way. Heaven is so close to you. It's so close. It's, it's, it's as close as the icon. It's even closer. Heaven is your own heart if you want it to be. And that's where it should be. Unlock your hearts, beloved, and find paradise there, and offer it to your neighbor. Always, now, and ever, the ages of ages.